those of you who are a little bit new to Journey Team, um, so we've been around for about 27 years, um, been doing this for a very long time. Um, we're a little over 120 t uh, members. Um, we're a two-time Partner of the Year winner for Microsoft, uh, three-time Best Places to Work. And as you can see on the screen, we've had a lot of customers, um, a lot of happy customers, uh, 14 gold, silver, Microsoft competencies are, are what we hold. Um, and while we're talking about Dynamics 365 today, um, we do cover a lot of, of, of different services across the Microsoft stack. Um, we actually have five different or six different practices that we operate under. We, we have one for, for ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning Accounting Systems, um, CRM, uh, our cloud team, which also does Microsoft 365 and Azure, Collaboration and Content, which works a lot with SharePoint and Teams and OneDrive, our data and BI team um, that does a lot with Power BI, but also with um, a lot of uh, AI, machine learning, et cetera. And then we also have a change management adoption practice that helps our, our customers be able to figure out the best way to adopt the software um, that, that we're implementing for them. Some people, when they start these really large projects, they have questions like this when they join meetings of what's the objective of this meeting, bro? Well, that's what Josh and I are going to describe to you today. Um, this is uh, th this is a case study that we did. Um, we uh, will we'll take accountability for this journey team. Asked the client a little too late uh, for them to uh, co-present this with us. So today we've scrubbed names, um, but this is a, an actual case study that we're going to be walking through and how it helped one of the larger media and communication companies in the country, um, you know, avoid, avoid a lot of uh, costs that could have uh, come their way. So, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and let Josh introduce himself first because he was really the uh, key component to, to this successful project. So Josh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, glad to be here. Um, very excited to be presenting uh, the Dynamics 365 Field Service Solution uh, implemented for Sorensen with you. Um, I've been in the Dynamics 365 industry for seven years, um, just worked with Journey Team for 1.5, uh, and I am the developer and architect, um, one of the leads on this project. Great project, a lot of success, and glad to be here to share with you. All right. And I am Eric Vines. Uh, only half of that beard exists today, so you'll get a Mustache Movember presentation from me. Uh, I've been on Dynamics since 2010 uh, when it was version 4.0. I participated in, in an upgrade to 4.0. Um, I've been a Journey team for almost six years now, and I started our local user group for Dynamics CRM back in 2011. And uh, just a, a quick fact, I love naps. I uh, especially love a very you know, potent, powerful power nap. Uh, if you can squeeze in 20 minutes, makes makes the difference to the day. So. Unfortunately, I have not had a nap yet uh, be before this presentation, so we'll see how it goes. Um, but but anyway, the, the, the company that we worked with, they, they came to us um, after they had had a series of meetings with, with Microsoft, uh, and, and this company produces equipment for the deaf and hard to hearing communities. Uh, so they actually manufacture um, in Southeast Asia. They have a whole inventory process, um, and so there's a number of large systems that we had to integrate with as well, um, but but they were evaluating a, a legacy platform that was coming up on about 20 years um, where it had, had been used and extended and customized and some other words uh, that we won't use, um, but, but essentially it had now grown to a point where um, they were facing quite a bit of, of uh, compliance risk uh, because of how the system had been architected and the costs of upkeep and the costs of improvement uh, continued to grow. And so they decided that they wanted to evaluate that. So after they evaluated Dynamics 365, uh, they determined that the core functionality could be met um, out of the box for the majority of, of their use cases. And so uh, they, they selected to go with us as their partner for implementation. So uh, just to, to hit on some of these again, some of the main drivers uh, that, that they were you know, trying to 
uh, work against, uh, the main being privacy and compliance. So because they receive funding from the federal government, uh, they have to remain in a highly regulated um, and audited state. Uh, and there were also a number of privacy risk concerns in their legacy system uh, that would have uh, exposed uh, violations. And, uh, and those violations, we'll talk about that near the end of, of kind of the ROI, but uh, those violations could add up to almost a million dollars a day. And so they were facing a, a deadline and, you know, actual real fines and costs um, by not, um, you know, improving the system or switching it out to dynamics, which they did. Um, so a couple other things you guys can be reading this slide while we talk about it. But, but basically, um, we knew that Microsoft played a, a key advantage in that. They offered a number of services uh, that we'll talk about today that, that we took advantage of. And, um, you know, it was, as Josh mentioned, it, it was a great project. It was it was very exciting. We, we pushed the, the envelope on a lot of technology. We even, you know, uh, worked with Microsoft's product group on, on some of the field service mobile application stuff. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, um, it was still a very large project. It was three companies um, underneath one holding that, that we had to implement. So we, we had to, to move three companies onto this platform. Uh, and we did all of that um, in less than 14 months. And that's from start to finish, discovery to code's been, you know, we've, we've released it, they've trained it, they've rolled it out, end users are using it. And, um, and, and you know, we've resolved all bugs. So, uh, you know, in terms of magnitude, uh, that this is, you know, this, this was a, a very large project, an extra large project. It was over 10,000 hours. Um, but again, the complexities that led to that and the timing for them to beat it, uh, beat that, that deadline um, before they started receiving violations were those drivers. Okay, um, that looks small on my screen. I hope you guys can read this, but we bring this up because anytime you go into a project, you have to have things that you use as anchors or milestones or directional you know, paths to let you know, are we doing uh, what we said we needed to do? And so for us, we define those as flag plants. A lot of times they're called success measures or measures of success. But we went through with this um, with this client and, and we basically identified um, a, a list of about a dozen things that had to happen. So like, hey, these things need to exist. If we could perform all of these actions, then we will consider this you know, project a success. So we went through those um, again. You know, you can you can read this material afterwards. But but essentially it was like we have to maintain all current functionality. We have to get rid of all of our compliance and privacy risks, and we have to improve <laughs> the process that we have today because it's manual, right? And and they couldn't continue to hire at the rate they did. So those were those were our measures of success or our flag plants that we like to call them at, at Journey Team. Like, hey, we planted the flag, we we got to the summit, um, and, and so this this was what we used throughout the project uh, to to measure. So we did. Uh, large company updates with them and, and progress was always shown on have we planted this flag, have we met this, have we met this, and we use that to help drive the, the project along. Josh, any comments uh, on these as, as a developer and somebody that was hands deep in this, you know, using these measures, it, it was helpful, right? As we went through the project and the business, the client was saying, okay, we still can't, I'm just gonna pick one of these, we still yeah. can't create, transfer, and manage inventory. And it's like, OK, all right, let's yeah. dive in. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's very interesting because oftentimes, you know, for developers, it's all about execute, 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 right? It's like, oh, I got this task, go and execute. But setting these flat plans were very, very helpful in that after execution, it hones down on the accountability part to say, hey, are we hitting our success measures? Are we hitting our flag plans? I, I would say definitely invaluable. It was amazing to have these, uh, to show the client, to show transparency and to be accountable. Yep, definitely. Okay, so a as we went through uh, this this process with them and, and um, I wouldn't say it's intentional that you probably can't read this, but uh, in order to fit their architecture on a slide, um, I made the picture small. So on the left hand, though, you, you kind of get the high level picture of all of the different 
systems and applications that were in use. Um, and, and so I'll read through these, but you know, here in a moment we'll, we'll dive into each of these and, and how they were built to service their, you know, their needs and meet those success measures. But uh, we leveraged the Azure service bus, we, we leveraged uh, Dynamics for Marketing, we leveraged sales and customer service, we leveraged field service um, extensively because they have over almost a thousand um, you know, people in the field remotely that, that, that have to be scheduled. Um, we use probably more Power Automate than we've ever wanted to use in our lives. Um, <laughs> and, and we also built a number of custom plugins and integrations. On top of that, our, our business intelligence team um, worked with their reporting group and, and we rewrote um, all of their reporting as well as we helped them implement uh, a SharePoint document management system that allows them to scale and got rid of this horribly antiquated numbering foldering system that was really hard to, to search. So all in all, like across the ecosystem, uh, we used every single one of our, our practices that we have here at Journey Team, um, and and it was you know really a, a large effort uh, to to get all of those pieces together. But it was it was well worth it, and the and the framework is providing them the scale. So in the last eight months since we've uh, gone live, you know we're supporting them with a fraction of Josh's time. We've trained their internal company, uh, and oh, and we went from a team of like 12 down to, you know, Josh is the only one supporting them. Um, and, and so part of that too is like, you have to, to make sure that your, your company is ready to, to manage these systems. And, and they had, you know, they had a really good infrastructure and, and plan for that. And then we just helped them accelerate their learning and showed them what we were doing while we went through the project. Okay. Any, uh, and, and I should state or restate what Mark had, had mentioned. Um, if, if you do have questions during this, feel free to drop those, um, you know, in into the chat. Uh, ignore the prior chat. Uh, that was for a different session. Somebody got confused. Um, but, but if you do have any questions as we go through this, please feel free to, to let us know. Um, but I do want to call out up at the very top in that Azure service bus, uh, there were four core systems that, that we had to integrate with, um, one being called core, but think of the proprietary information that these devices have to log. That's their core system. Um, and so we had to integrate with two of those. We integrated with Dynamics AX um, as their you know finance and, and supply chain system, as well as Azure Active Directory. So number of, of um, you know, enterprise systems as well and, and native systems that we had to integrate with. Okay. Um, clicky click. Next. All right, D365 for marketing. Um, I'm gonna take this and, and talk about it just for a second. Um, we used a fraction of, of what Dynamics uh, Marketing is, um, is, is designed to do. So Dynamics Marketing is this whole giant campaign automation and event management uh, solution. What we needed though was the initial front door into this company's business process. So we needed a lead application capture. And so we leveraged Dynamics for Marketing because of its ability to tie back into sales and into the lead process and because of how you could create different you know, forms and pages uh, to do the mapping of, of those forms. So what you're looking at here on the slide, this is an example of the first page of their application, um, but they would go through, out, through and, and fill out a number of fields that we would then use for the rest of the application process that was managed in Dynamics behind the scenes. Um, but the other advantages that, that uh, came with, with using these forms are that we also enabled a lot of the script tracking we could monitor form submissions. We could see what data was coming in. We could go back and validate the submission, um, and and use some of that data for analytics to determine, you know, was was the page capturing and moving people through the lead application process um, quickly enough. So again, those those would come through marketing. Um, marketing forms convert those submissions into leads. If they already exist, there's mapping or 
uh, contact matching strategies. Uh, so it would try and append those uh, to existing ones. Um, otherwise, it would put them through the new sales process. And um, Josh, I'll let you take over and, and talk about how we built out that, that lead application to you know, contact. Absolutely. Uh, so again, kind of on the forefront, uh, one of the sources of the lead data is what uh, Eric kind of alluded to, where we have kind of a marketing capture control within the website or basically any external facing site where data is captured. Now, once it comes in, you basically hand it to Dynamics on the on the leads control. And I have kind of a, a brief demonstration of what data points we were capturing and what that process looks like. Okay. So I'll jump into the video. Um, again, for instance, if a lead came through the website, there are multiple ways leads are basically captured. It could come from a web um, manually created from other sources. We capture certain uh, application details of the customer. Uh, we we cut, capture customer information information and one of the most important things was the phone number um, solution right because the telecommunication company numbers were very very important to them uh, we also captured individual information up, around whether someone is deaf or not whether someone is applying on behalf of someone all of those things were captured on the lead now on the phone number record since um, you know you could use a traditional telephone string field but they needed more data points around the phone number. So we created a new table called numbers where all uh, numbers were captured. And we also captured historical uh, changes around those phone numbers. Whether a phone number is primary or not, all of those were flagged on the number and also captured um, on the lead. Through after qualification process, we basically used the relationship mapping control out of the box to map data between the lead to opportunity and then to the account. As you can see, the account was created. All the data was mapped from the lead to the account, including the number solution. Uh, we go through the registration information um, where we capture username, passwords. These were encrypted using AES encryption in Dynamics to store these passwords. Uh, we, we capture lead information, um, TRS, URD information. This is mostly for the third party solution. Uh, we captured lead screening things that they need to uh, go through and uh, approve before they can truly be considered leads. Uh, any technical details, uh, associated work orders, any e-signed documents were captured in here. Um, and then uh, field service, things around geolocation, all of those were, were captured within the account. Now, all of these are kind of prelude to the actual scheduling of the customer where a technician will basically go out. But as far as the lead application process of the funnel, uh, this is this is um, kind of the high level implementation. There were a lot of custom fields created, a lot of um, processes behind the scenes automation. Now, one core thing that we introduced is what we called connections. Uh, it's out of the box. For every customer, the customer could be related to uh, uh, an aunt, uh, a husband, uh, a daughter, um, an employee. So we use the connection control to basically build all those relationships uh, between um, an account, a customer, and, and um, their related um, their relationships, basically. And we use the connection control. And that would be like uh, a referring provider, like a doctor mm -hmm. as well. So, so we would yep. have to capture all of these, you know, multiple many to many relationship types connections. Is there and available out of the uh, out of the box? Mm -hmm. um, so we use that and leverage that, uh, and then you know, taught them how to report on it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. The the difficulty with using the out of the box, you know, account hierarchy structure is. You know, you have kind of a, a one to many relationship. Now, these relationships were hard to define. And so using connections was very efficient because you can define a role to Eric's point, right? Whether it's a practitioner, an auntie, a daughter, a provider, we can use those connection roles to 
define those relationships between two records. And it was very, very efficient for them, easy to report, um, especially with the complexity of those relationships. Okay. So that's kind of what we, we used. And once the leads were, were created and accounts were created, they were considered customers. From there, we, we basically support them using kind of the customer service uh, implementation. And I'll turn that over to uh, Eric to take over customer service. Great. Okay. So within uh, the customer service application, the components that, that we used or the, you know, the tables and the framework, um, it looks like I got comma happy. That, mm -hmm. That's a weird edit. <laughs> Apologies, clean that up. Uh, but we use cases, articles. Uh, we did build our own custom subject tree, and there, there's a reason for that uh, that you'll see here in a minute. Uh, and then we leveraged the out of the box uh, convert to work order. So you can convert an opportunity to a work order, and Josh will talk about that a little bit um, you know, when we get to, uh, to build service. But in almost a, a very similar way, uh, you can you know convert a case to a work order. We'll we'll show that here in a, in a second. Um, but but those those two items, um, case management, uh, most of of what you see here and what we put together for them um, leveraged out of the box functionality. Uh, we did have to pull in and and again support uh, you know number. Uh, information and account information with the new hierarchy that we kind of set up. Um, but then, as you can see, we, we built out this new subject and resolution tree because they needed deeper classification because of how their IT and customer service groups had been set up. So they had a wealth of uh, information before. It just wasn't very easy to find and search. So we had a whole effort where we took all of these documents that they had out on intranets and in SharePoint, um, and we coalesced all that together, and we worked with their teams uh, that supported customer service. Uh, we moved those into knowledge articles. Now, the great thing about knowledge articles is that they are tied to uh, the case and the case details. So as information is provided in, in the case summary um, and in those details, it will search the articles. Now, um, you know, between the subjects and the resolutions and just some of the modifications that we made to the case, and then in addition to the articles, uh, this, this helped solve the majority of, of their customer support needs. But again, the biggest one was, okay, and what's this related to? Nine times out of 10, it's related to an install or to, to a work order. And so we pulled forward that, that work order subgrid so that that case always had uh, relevance and, and reference to the other work that's being performed, but even something that isn't considered customer service. So again, there's, there's lots of different ways to look at the same data and different teams, in this case, customer service, they wanted to see work orders only as they related to the account uh, to see if, if that's why they were calling in. Whereas somebody that's in field service, you know, they're, you know, they may only want to know about a case in a one-off situation. So uh, lots of different ways to see the data, and a lot of it de depends on uh, the use case and, and who that user is and how they're going to use the system. Um, but very cool, uh, SLAs were put into place, so they're able to monitor like how long the case has been sitting there. They have escalation rules they put in. Um, they built a ton of views and dashboards to help monitor this and stay on top of certain exceptions or edge cases. Uh, so I would say they're probably masters at views now um, because they have a lot of exceptions and we nicely suggested and told them, no, we don't build processes around exceptions, <laughs> but we'll build you views so you can see the things that fall out of your process. Um, anyway, so that, that was a good experience and, and um, process with them. So the case to work order, uh, again, same way that we were just looking at a case, you go in, you define it, what type is it, who needs to work on it, what's our classification, uh, you know, what type of issue is it. Uh, but as you identify uh, that information, there is a button at the, the top of the case that, that allows you to convert to a work order. Uh, you can see that bottom button there kind of right underneath the, the search. As it does that, it will pull data from the case record pre-populate that into the work order. Um, and Josh, I can't remember. I want to say that we did tie it so that based on 
Yep, there you go. That primary incident type, we would pre-populate the work order also. Uh, so correct. we tried, yeah, we, we tried to make it so that if you were in customer service, you could fill out as much information on the case because that's what you worked in. But when they hit that convert to work order button, it would map and move all that data over automatically so that somebody didn't have to enter it in again. So even though something simple as that is just a relationship mapping and uh, pulls data over, um, this was a huge efficiency gain uh, for these guys. And there were a lot of sub processes around number handling, you know, like porting new numbers in or a customer leaving and they had to release numbers. Those were all managed uh, through Dynamics and through this process. And now instead of having to you know, like swivel chair type data in two systems, uh, Dynamics uh, was was populating it and then also integrating to those uh, those systems in the background that you saw on our architecture slide. So very cool um, scenario here. Their customer service, uh, their their um, their handle times and, and the amount of time that they were spending uh, decreased because they were able to cut out a lot of those you know, manual steps of retyping information. Yeah. So just to kind of piggyback on, on that, uh, the video kind of goes a little bit faster. But um, as Eric alluded, what traditionally happens is the CSRs are the kind of the first line of defense, right? If a customer calls in, they basically say, OK, what, what are you facing? What, what is your issue? They capture as much information as they possibly can about the product that the customer is reporting about. And then they use the subject tree to define or give additional classification to the issue. They capture any network information, anything about the product. And then from there, they need to make an informed decision about what incident type to associate to that case, to Eric's point. Now, once that has been defined, then it's ready to be worked on. At that point is when they convert it to a work order for a technician to go out and take care of it. So, so very, very streamlined. Again, we have kind of a new customer flow that goes through leads, and then we have an existing customer flow that goes through cases. So we, yeah, very, very uh, neat um, approach and execution to help both the uh, tech, uh, the back office team and also the CSRs to basically support a customer at the same time. Yep. Um, and, and then lastly, the, the one nice thing that came out of this is that as a company, they were able to they were able to reorganize and kind of change their approach to service. And they actually consolidated two different departments together. Um, and because of dynamics, giving them some of that scalability yeah. they, they were able to train easier and, and and roll two departments into one so yeah. there were even some operational efficiencies uh that, that they got out of the the system so yeah. josh i'll let you take it back and we'll dive yeah. into really the you know the meat the and meat. potatoes <laughs> thank you all right well um as er eric kind of has covered in the uh the kind of we we've talked now we've talked about a lead to an account. Now a work order has been created for someone to go out to to a customer's home. So that's for a new customer flow, right? We've also talked about an existing customer who has an issue with a device going through kind of a case to a work order flow. Now, as you can tell, with both of these processes, they all converge on a, a work order because the work order is where we put as much information as we possibly can about the activity to be performed so that a technician can go out and actually help the customer resolve the issue, okay? And as part of that whole implementation is kind of what we call the field service implementation. Now, for a technician to go out to a, a customer's home, there were some requirements that we had to develop and put in the backbone of the application. One of those key things was territory management. Because they are such a big company and they operate in a lot of different states, they wanted to group their technicians by territories, right? So that if I'm in Utah and I'm a technician in Utah, I can only be the one responsible to help someone within my territory. So territory management was key, uh, very, very key to the implementation. And 
how they basically set it up is they basically broke their territories into two different operational, I, I, I would say two different verticals, right? You would have the operation hierarchy and then you would have the sales hierarchy, okay? So they have the sales where the sales team is basically responsible for their regions, their districts, their states, and then that for each state, they had to create postal codes within within those states. Now, traditionally, you keep postal codes in a separate table, but because they wanted to associate sales territories and operational territories to the same postal code and out of the box, that is not feasible. We decided to make postal codes the leaf node in the territory hierarchy. That way they can associate multiple territories to the same postal code. This was very, very efficient for them um, so that they could organizationally structure the sales and the operational teams efficiently for reporting and also associating uh, work orders to the right technicians for those, those territories. So very, very heavy lift, but we built it that way so that they could manage it better and also report it better. So um, definitely one of those kind of a little bit out of the box thinking we had to to develop to make kind of the dynamics implementation fit the business model. Um, another thing, and, for and again, really, that was there. You know, the two use cases: there was sales, and then there was you know operations with you know the field team, and and both had a slightly different need for postal code, but they both needed it. <laughs> and and so one of the advantages of of this design was that it allowed those two to, to grow and be different ter uh, hierarchies um, while still using the same postal code. And, and, that's, and that's necessary because of how we do assignments and, mm -hmm. and like resourcing in field service, um, as well as how accounts are assigned territories <laughs> on the signup process so based on your address. So yeah. it, it's a very critical component and they were asking for something that didn't exist. So we had to come up with with a, a smooth solution that worked for them. Yeah, yeah. Cool. so very, very, very uh, unique. Now, as with a, any company and what uh, kind of was key to this whole reason we started this whole project was security. Security was one of the backbone reasons why, you know, they decided to start with this whole implementation. So in this particular case, security was also a factor. Now, for every account, or a book of business, there were key players that were responsible for each account, right? So for every territory or postal code, we had to also implement a team membership solution where the postal code basically is the team name. And then for that team, we associate the people that are responsible for that postal code. That way, every account that is in that postal code will fall under the responsibility of those team members, right? So when a new account is created and the postal code is say 84009, we find the correct team 84009 and we make it the owner of that account. That way by default, security um, access gets rolled down to those people responsible. And then not everyone can basically see accounts in in that, that particular um, area. Now I'll tell you this solution is not unique. There are a lot of businesses with sales and operational teams that need a solution, right? Where this uh, we don't want people seeing accounts in this zip code, or we don't want people to change this data because they are not responsible for it. And we felt that this out of the box thinking and solution was was the right way. It was easy for them to manage um, users and and scale. So that's kind of what we did as far as territory management is concerned. And once the territory has been associated and the right technicians have been assigned, that leads us uh, into work order booking and scheduling. So again, we at this point in, in kind of the process, we've identified what activity needs to be performed in the customer's home. Um, either this person is a new customer and we are saying, oh, this is a new installation or an existing customer where we need to do support 
they all land on work orders. Now work order you can think of is kind of like kind of a template that houses activities need to be performed, uh, requirements needed for uh, the solution to the problem, right? So we define what incidents, what, what products need to be used, what services are associated with that, those uh, activities, and even checklist of tasks that need to be performed in the customer's home for the success of the work order. And so on the work order is where we define all these characteristics and requirements. And then at that point, we book the work order, we basically schedule the work order for execution, okay? So in here is kind of, this is kind of uh, the solution we, we designed for them. Uh, a lot of form changes, a lot of um, background processes that run for data to be moved or sensitive uh, um, piece rates, uh, sensitive payment details, piece rates, or they call them incentives in their terminology uh, to be pulled to the work order to say, this is what is needed. Uh, and then from there, you basically can book uh, the, the work order. And then that will take you straight to a booking where the, you, the technician will basically track progress on the activity be, being done. Okay, so high level again, work order, it's a template for activity to be performed. Uh, the book solution is how you find an available resource to perform the activity. And the booking is the actual appointment that we created for the technician to basically use as a kind of a, a yardstick uh, to progress in, in, in the activity. Now, in the solution that we designed for them, they needed a, a way for a technician to capture um, agreements once the activity was completed. Now we considered using third party solutions like DocuSign, um, Adobe Sign. Uh, and at the end of the day, those solutions were just too robust for what they were basically looking for. They needed uh, a solution where someone can basically um, read an agreement and check a box. Um, so with cost kind of cost and benefit analysis performed by the business, they felt like a custom solution would be ideal. So we built a solution, kind of a, a, a native e-sign solution where um, an agreement is displayed, the customer reads it and acknowledges it. And we basically embedded it within the booking uh, form in the kind of operations uh, field service model driven app. And that's that's what you're looking at right now. Uh, you just hit a new, you read the agreement, you sign it, and then an agreement record is basically created at the end. And they have to basically agree to kind of a few agreements <laughs> in order to, to finish the activity. So that goes from there. We also put an instructions page so that a technician who is new to the product can basically read and say, oh, this is kind of what I need to do. Uh, in conjunction with the with the service tasks. And these were kind of static instructions that every booking needed. Uh, we didn't feel like that needs to be in uh, multiple records added to uh, like incident types. So we created an embedded resource to show those instructions always. And that's kind of yeah. uh, how how we designed that. And, and I would just say like the uh you know that instruction piece at the very end that was uh, that was adopted really well by their training team and, and the actual field trainers because every time you hired somebody new one of the things that's always the most difficult is hey here's how you have to use these systems um, but they would go through their training and they'd be like hey and don't worry if you ever forget a step you can just go to the instruction tab so um, perfect yeah, and, and if anybody has any questions, again, if if we're going through this uh, or if you've got any you know questions, please drop them in the chat. Um, you know, we'd we'd be happy to to answer those. And it looks like Mark just uh, Mark just posted about that as well. <laughs> right, he beat right. you to it. I know. He beat you it. to it. Okay. <laughs> All right. The final the final piece of this solution was basically the payment piece, right? Um, uh, again, in any kind of flow. You have a tech. Uh, you define the activity need, needed to be done. The technician goes into the custom customer's home and executes. And then at the end, uh, an invoice is basically generated for the customer so that they know 
what cost was involved in, in the completion of that activity. We basically use the uh, close uh, posting of the work order to invoice flow. So once uh, a, a work order is completed, all the product and services used will basically be transferred to the invoice so that the customer can receive that invoice and, and make any payments. They, they for, for Sorensen specifically, instead of sending that to the customer, um, they basically use that same um, data to pay the uh, technicians. So the invoice generated was not to the customer or, or, or to the government, but uh, to, to be used to pay the technicians uh, on, on services that they rendered as well. So neat solution, dual purpose, and it sat satisfied bo both use cases. Uh, I'll turn the time over awesome. to you for the Azure piece on all the backend services developed uh, to make this feasible. Yeah, um, so uh, again, there are a number of tools in Azure and Azure is a, a very broad term when people are like, oh yeah, just use Azure. Um, but in, inside of Azure, there are probably at least five or six different ways that, that you can use components or, or pieces of the platform to, to integrate. We used the Azure Service Bus um, because it had the ability for queues. Um, and, and so just the, the concept of, of Azure, right, is, is that you have that queue and um, it it is fed messages and those messages are based on on triggers and for us there were a number of of triggers um, and and events that we had to look for to then create these me messages to go drop in these queues uh, so that then you know the the other receiving system uh, could could you know get that update and, and so we we went through and, and we built um, we built services for the account registration and like the account setup, account verification. So all those things, you know, Josh and I have talked about up to this point around the account. Um, those those accounts would would update. Um, oh, and we had to build different queues and buses uh, for the different companies because they both treated dynamics differently in terms of it being a source of record for data. So one of the companies was CRM to their core system. And one company was their core system CRM. So we basically had to build a, build a, <laughs> a mirror copy of, of both functions, but the other way. Um, but, but we would go through and handle things like um, asset updates. So if a serialized part, which we haven't talked about serialized inventory yet, Josh, uh, we, we have our own proprietary solution that we installed. They manage, again, uh, equipment that's been manufactured. So there's a lot of serialized inventory. Um, but but we would handle uh, the updates of assets. So if if there was an update made to one of the devices in somebody's home, um, then those queues would look for that and they'd see that, oh, the, the device made a new connection to the core system. Oh, we see that, oh, it matches this this trigger, go send a message to the queue. Uh, so we would, we would build different systems like that. Uh, I'm just doing a quick count here. I think we set up, geez, probably close to two dozen um, services and, and messages uh, to, to be dropped in the in the queues. Um, and I think we've got five queues. So, you know, dozens of messages um, with various queues to then make sure that we're managing all of the updates. Now, the reason why we chose this architecture, sorry, Josh, did you have a comment? No, you're fine. I finished okay. that thought and then we, I will add to it briefly. Okay. Um, it doesn't show on the image, so it, no. it's, you know, yeah. It's a generic image. Um, yeah. <laughs> the, so so the, one of the advantages and one of the reasons why we went the service bus route is that um, in the event that there's fluctuations of volume, right? So if a number of updates or requests happen at one time, other integration methods, there is the potential of loss, meaning you've got to have like logging and you got to, you know, have retry attempts and all these things. The service bus gave us a framework that allowed them to scale that volume um, 
kind of exponentially, right? And, and so it was an effective way for them to be able to see like, oh, okay, uh, wow, the queue just spiked. What happened? Oh, yeah, duh, we just rolled out a product update. So, you know, 20,000 devices just had a version change and, you know, updated something, right? So um, it's nice because it, it captures all of those events. It just queues them all up and you can see kind of the order of execution, uh, but you don't you don't lose as much and it lets you handle large volume of transactions. So you're talking thousands to tens of thousands of requests that could be made, you know, within the, the hour, within the minute. Sorry, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And again, it doesn't show here, but analytics around it, you know, um, we use in the Azure analytics, um, application insights to see, you know, load on different servers, right? And, and see which one is processing more. It allows you to see things that were processed and failed that go into either the dead letter queue or something to be reprocessed. But um, Eric mentioned this, but I kind of wanted to, to hit on it again. What, one of the key things that this gave, gives us is state, like state, state storage. If you have your traditional HTTP service or trigger, what traditionally happens is when you make an HTTP request to an API, some kind of API, and it fails, you lose the state of the data unless you build something custom to store the, the state in kind of like a Redis storage or some kind of database. You, you get more benefit using a message bro broker like an Azure service bus because you keep state or you manage the state, right? The state of the data. So it never gets lost. You can reprocess it. If it fails, you can debug it and understand why it failed and perfect your, your consumer, right? Your the, uh, the, the application consuming the data and processing it. So it gave us more autonomy in updating the business logic of the consumer to help speed up the, uh, the, uh, the uh, processes. So again, it's yep. not in here, but a lot uh, of cool a, things yeah cool application things in, yeah, <laughs> yeah application insights is is a very powerful tool within the azure framework and uh it was used quite a bit extensively <laughs> on this on this project uh the other cool thing that we did with within azure uh was the leverage leveraging uh, security group so in dynamics there is there is a newer feature um, that allows you to basically take your your Active Directory and your teams in Dynamics. You can assign team security roles in Dynamics um, that lets them you know view, update, do whatever they want with records. Well, in Azure Active Directory, that's really where IT makes things happen. Like, oh, you're a new user. Let me give you a license and let me put you in this group. The disconnect is always between managing two different systems um, permissions. So what we did is we tied those together using um, functionality that the Dynamics and Azure have, which is link the security group to the team. So they've they've customized this so that there's a place that you can drop in uh, the security group ID or the um, office group ID, but you can then link it to those teams. And now what happens is that when I'm a new user and I'm given my license and I'm added to this security group, then what that does is it automatically adds me to that dynamics team which i inherit permissions from so what this helped uh internally for them was administration and overhead right like how do we manage all of our users and everything so what we did is we moved it upstream as just part of their provisioning and onboarding process and we took out a huge headache of, of managing security roles you know manually in dynamics and just moved it into their standard onboarding process. So another, you know, huge win. Uh, we didn't get actual ROIs on this, but you know, the their IT sponsors that we were working on the project were like, why can't all the applications do this? <laughs> you know, so huge win there uh, with just a, a small piece of functionality that's that's been released in in dynamics. Okay. We'll go ahead and pass it back over to you, Josh, and we'll yes, jump sir. into Power Automate. Yeah. Um, okay. So we've talked a lot about code solutions that we built using message brokers like Azure Service Bus. We've also talked a lot about plugins that we built in .NET C Sharp code 
to help facilitate some of these business logic or uh, these core functionalities within the application. But even before we got to that point of actually developing code, one of the things that we consider upfront is whether we can build something in a low code, no code uh, framework like Power Automate uh, before we even considered those. Uh, now we chose Power Automate, uh, you know, because the benefits are basically unmatched, right? You can, um, uh, you, you get um, benefits where you can build solutions and easily transfer it to the customer without having long sessions with them explaining each line of code, <laughs> right? It's, it's very user friendly. You have drag and drop capabilities and you have over 200 connectors to use, right? You can use SharePoint, you can use Twilio, you can use all these connectors that people have spent countless hours building just for you to plug and play, right? So as far as some of these automations that we built behind the scenes, we considered uh, Power Automate uh, heavily uh, to make that possible. Now, as I said, we wrote a lot of Power Automates. <laughs> this spending time kind of breaking each Power Automate apart and, and kind of explaining what each of those did will take so much more time. And so it's kind of highlight that I picked one of it, uh, one of the Power Automates that we built that kind of was built to help um, build mainly for security reasons to allow everyone to upload a SharePoint, upload a document, but not everyone to see it. I'll say that again. They wanted a way to upload, everyone have the ability to upload a document, but not allow everyone to see the document just for security yeah. reasons. And let, so, let me give a let me give an yeah. actual use case. So yeah. <laughs> if I, and they call them trainers, but if I'm in your yeah. home and I'm installing this uh, you know, device for a deaf user. Um, one of the things that I might be required is proof of identity. And so mm -hmm. I have to take a picture on my field service mobile app <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and take a picture of your driver's license. And then I have to use the app and what we've built. And so on that booking, there's that uploads thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I would do that. But the catch is once I've uploaded that driver's license picture, I can't see it again. That's now something only compliance can look at. And so we had to come up with a way that let us let the user create and modify, but not you. Yeah. So good <laughs> very, time. very interesting. <laughs> so this very, is what Josh, Josh and the team put together. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to kind of piggyback on what Eric said, uh, with that being kind of the problem we had to solve, we had to kind of introduce an abstraction layer. And we did that with a new entity we call document upload. Now that document upload gave us the ability to control permissions on that entity. And then we also used Power Automate to basically upload the file once it's been dropped in Dynamics, upload it to SharePoint and then remove the file from Dynamics. Now with a document association, you either have all permissions or you don't. And so this abstraction layer, layer gave us the uh, freedom to basically modify the security and then use this Power Automate to sync the data to SharePoint. Uh, so again, very neat feature. It, it, we use the SharePoint connector and the uh, Microsoft Dataverse connectors to, to make this uh, possible. The last uh, solution that we kind of want to highlight is these custom solutions that we built. Now, once we stood up the environment and everything was, everyone was happy about it, as they continue to use the uh, product, they, 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 they identified the difficulty of updating data, data in bulk or changing things in bulk. Uh, they, they loved the Excel import for uh, updating data in, in data in tables, but when you don't have a lot of keys, to use as the identifier to update the data, it introduced a lot of difficulty. And so things around e-signatures, uh, updating work order in bulk or creating work order in bulk, adding users to access team in bulk and removing users in bulk, um, and even some of some portal things that uh, they, they do, it became difficult. And so we had to build these custom solutions for them um, to, to allow that to be, to be feasible.
Okay. So I'll go over a few of them that we built. Um, for operations, we introduced three new tools, um, and, and these are the ones that I'll talk about for now. There are other tools that we built, um, but I just want to focus on these three uh, in the interest of time. Uh, one of them was the bulk, the work order uh, creation in bulk, which basically allows them to select a price list, a work order type, incident type, choose a resource and add a bunch of customer IDs. Now, these customer IDs are not the GUIDs. They have IDs that they use, five character IDs that they use in the external system. And they get those, but they don't get the GUIDs. So we had to be creative in building the solution to allow them to use those external system IDs in order to be able to create these work, work orders in bulk. Uh, another thing that they wanted was they wanted an ability to export customers in bulk so they get a bunch of customer IDs. They want to be able to uh, drop them in this uh, input field, choose a system view or a personal view, and then hit a button, and then it will download an Excel sheet for them with data for all those customer IDs so they can use uh, it. Uh, they can send it to a third party or update the data and re-import it uh, or, or manipulate the data. And we had to build this tool for them. Which uh, I'll just take one second. I know we're trying to, we've got like, I don't know, five more slides. Five minutes. <laughs> uh, but, but one key thing here that I want to call out, and it's one of those small, simple wins again that we didn't realize the impact it had. But because Dynamics is a Microsoft tool and out, sorry, like Excel works natively in it, their minds were blown when we showed them views and like you could export and do all this stuff. So, custom tools like this started coming out of the woodwork because we found that they had all these one-off manual spreadsheets that they had to do all this stuff with and and they were id driven and so they were trying to approach you know the old problem in dynamics the same way but when it was like they finally figured out like oh there's views in excel like hey is there a way that we can just you know give you all the ideas ids and dump it out so huge uh, you know like eye opener and and another win for dynamics for these for this company because in their legacy system they never had the ability to export to excel and so now we've given them a tool that they could go and do these one off analyses with with data from the system that's accurate and then they knew how to go back in and do the updates as well so sorry yeah. josh i just want to call no, that no, out absolutely like, small and little feature i concur huge, yeah huge yeah benefit. absolutely huge win for them uh, again, you know, if you could talk to one of the uh, lead uh, project leads, they will you'll give you all, us all the praise on this because it cut down so much time on exporting, manipulating the data and importing and basically twiddling your thumb waiting for the execution to complete. You have a, a synchronous process where you can basically track these changes as they happen. So amazing win for them. Okay. The last one that we built for them is Access Team Manager. If you are a Dynamics user, one of the things you know is that updating a many to many table is like a nightmare and access team particularly was one of the hardest things that people struggling struggle updating right Up, removing users in bulk or adding users in bulk to an account so we added this tool where they can choose a group of users choose a group of accounts by id again another uh, <laughs> id driven uh, solution and then two buttons where they can hit add to add those users to those access teams or uh, 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 remove those users from the access team. Okay, so another huge win there. The final okay. thing that we, we built for them is the self-service portal. Uh, I'll finish this really quickly. Um, they, they wanted a way for customers to be able to go in there and actually finish the uh, portal uh, themselves. So we built them kind of a self-service portal where um, you know, we, we, we couldn't use a lot of the out-of-the-box uh, portal uh, solution. So we built them this uh, generic sign-up flow that allows them to get, uh, sorry, kind of skipping to the kind of the end a little bit, gives some suggested time slots for technicians to come to the customer's home. And then once they choose the uh, time, they get a booking confirmation with a, an accompanying email for the technician to go visit. So a nice self-service portal where they can basically sign up and 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 have a technician show up in their home. So these yep. were very, very useful tools that we built for them uh, to make their the life easy. 
and I'll awesome. turn the time back to you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Josh. And and those um, you know those custom items like that self service portal. There is one that Microsoft provides, but it requires people to sign in in order to go do the booking, and that was like the first red flag that didn't allow us to do that. So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, like we, we've we've touched on these as, we, as we've gone through this, but but this transformation, it took time, right? Like this this was a, a year plus project. It was 13 months, um, but through the course of that, the the number one thing that we helped them with was their privacy and compliance. So we stopped them from having to pay fines. So there's huge you know opportunity cost uh, that 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 we were able to leverage there. The other thing over a 10% um, increased response rate uh, and average handle time, uh, sorry, decreased and average handle time, increased you know, average speed of answer uh, for their customer service teams. Uh, the data accuracy and reporting, uh, again, like that was a huge area. We came in, we helped them you know, clean up all their reports and have visibility into this process. We've talked about all the, you know, Excel efficiencies and just being able to like you know manage their own data and their own views uh, and pulling that ad hoc information. Um, we're we're still you know trying to wrap up the the final like ROIs with with these guys at at the um, at the one year mark. But so far this has been an extremely um, uh, you know profitable in terms of like paying back the the investment. Uh, it it it's been able to scale, support, and grow even in the last eight months, uh, what this organization was looking for. So we want to thank everybody for joining us today. And um, again, if, if you have any questions, feel free to let us know. And as always, we would love to hear uh, your, your feedback in, in the session survey. And we'd love for you uh, to have your chance to win an awesome Surface laptop. So thanks, everybody, for joining the session. Thanks to Josh Bohan for being the world's best developer and, and building this platform with the team and <laughs> talk to y'all on the other side. Thank you.